What's this? Another vlog so soon? Yes, because I did not just see one movie this past weekend, I saw two. The first one was a movie that has already been out for a few days. The second one, however, is a movie that has not officially been released yet. I was lucky enough, if that's the right word for it, to attend an advanced screening for Pan. The latest movie featuring the character of Peter Pan and a prequel of sorts for the character. And, well... This was... Interesting, to say the least. The movie starts out with Peter's mother delivering him to an orphanage as a baby, and apparently she's some kind of ninja or something, because while concealing baby Peter inside her coat, she manages to scale the fence outside this orphanage, which had to be at least 10 feet tall in a single freaking bound. Not because she can fly or anything, she's just that good. So... Okay, whatever. Then we fast forward to Peter being about 12 or so, and apparently this all takes place in the middle of World War II, as there are constant bombing raids going on in London at the time. And this orphanage, by the way, is run by the most comically over-the-top evil nuns. And these over-the-top, stereotypically evil nuns are selling the orphan boys to the Neverland Pirates. Because why not? And one night, Peter is taken by the pirates, who arrive at the orphanage in some flying ships. Because sure. And then the ship flies away while being chased by some World War II fighter planes. And that's when I started to think, you know what? This is probably going to be a really, really weird movie. But nothing could prepare me for what would happen next, because... After they get to Neverland, they are introduced to the leader of the pirates, Blackbeard, played by Hugh Jackman. Blackbeard is using all of these children, and a handful of adults as well, to work in this mine that he operates, and what they are mining is something called Pixum, or fairy dust. Although it's not actually dust, really, it's just these chunks of glowing rock, but apparently this stuff does not make you fly. You would think that, but then again, that's because you're remembering the Peter Pan story you grew up with. This is not that story. Um, no, apparently this stuff, when you inhale it, it drastically reduces the effects of aging. It's almost like that stuff that they used in Jupiter Ascending, and not the only time this movie reminded me of Jupiter Ascending, but we'll get to that. But yeah, it's, it's basically the Fountain of Youth in crack form. And then it gets weird. Because, <laughs> yes, and then it gets weird because when they arrive at this giant mine, the pirates and all of the slaves and even Blackbeard himself all start singing... Smells like teen spirits. I'm gonna say that again. The Neverland Pirates, and all of the slaves in the mine, and everyone, starts singing the Nirvana classic, Smells like teen spirits. And it's not the only time they do something like this either. A little later on, they start singing Blitzkrieg Bop. Now, part of me is thinking, what? And another part of me is thinking, we already established that this takes place during World War II, so how are they singing a song that won't be written for another 50 years? And there's another part of me thinking, no, seriously, what? And that's when I knew that this was going to be a really, really weird two hours. And you expect a little bit of weirdness in a Peter Pan movie, but not like this. I mean, goddamn. Now, if you go into this movie thinking you will find anything that resembles the Peter Pan story that you grew up with, 
Regardless of what version you grew up with, whether it's the Disney version or the original book or Hook with Robin Williams, doesn't matter. You're not going to find any trace of that here. You'll find the character names, and that's about it. Because, yeah, we got Peter, we got James Hook, who is not yet a captain. This is pre-Captain Hook. You got Tiger Lily, you got Smee, you got, well, Tinkerbell for about 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, glorified cameo, and that's it. And you have mermaids, you have a crocodile who does not take Hook's hand in this movie, which really pissed me off because they teased it a couple of times and it never happened. If Why would you do a prequel for this character and not show us how he got his hand bit off? What the hell? I don't know if they're just trying to keep it kid-friendly, but every kid knows this story. They know he loses his hand. He's not wearing the hook for decoration. No, this is not your grandparents' Peter Pan story. This is not your parents' Peter Pan story. It's not even your Peter Pan story. This is... Peter Pan is the chosen one come to save Neverland from the tyranny of Blackbeard. Yeah, really. And apparently he is the only person in this universe who can actually fly. Because the fairy dust doesn't make you fly, that just makes you not age. Because why not? No. Peter is able to fly because he's, like, half human, half fairy. Don't ask me how that works. And yes, they do actually refer to him by the words chosen one, and there is even one point where they use the word Messiah. And his mother's name is Mary. I'm not kidding. Little on the nose there, huh? There's also this really weird romance between Hook and Tiger Lily. And no, really, it's... I, I don't know why they thought this would be a good idea. It's just really weird. It feels forced. The actors make it look like it's forced because they got no chemistry at all. It just, it's unnecessary. And speaking of Tiger Lily, I guess we got to talk about the controversy with the casting of this character. Yes, Tiger Lily is played by Rooney Mara, a character that has been depicted as a Native American even though they're not actually in America, but whatever. A character that has been pictured as a Native American in all previous versions of this story is played by a white girl. Not the first time this has happened, mind you. I, I have seen this happen before, and it was no less weird then, but that's how they're doing this. And it's not quite as racist as you think. Well, it is and it isn't. Let me explain. It really seems to me that the people who made this movie were going out of their way to not be racially insensitive when it came to the natives, as previous versions of this story have often been. I mean, this the original version of this story was made in a different time back when racial sensitivities were not as popular as they are nowadays, so yeah, it was kind of racist. And they seem to be doing their damnedest to avoid that, almost to the point of hilarity. No, not almost. To the point of hilarity. Because this tiny group of natives is the most racially diverse group of natives you will ever find. They got every skin color you can think of in this group, every nationality. It's just they really tried to make this a multicultural group without stopping to think if any of this actually made any goddamn sense. Which it doesn't. Especially when you consider that Tiger Lily is a white girl and Tiger Lily's father, the chief, is an Aboriginal Australian. And here's the thing. I get what they were trying to do. I can appreciate what they wanted to accomplish here and what they did not want to accomplish and... Bless their hearts. This really is a bless your heart moment. You know, bless their hearts for trying. And I firmly believe their hearts were in the right place. I also believe they tried way too goddamn hard. And it shows. And it's just laughably silly. And really, they should have just kept them as Native Americans and cast a bunch of Native American actors to play these parts. Because... 
there's a right way to do that. Yes, previous versions of the story did not treat these characters with the utmost of respect, but that doesn't mean the people writing this story can't do that, since they're basically disregarding all the previous stories and just doing their own thing anyway, so... What's stopping them, really? I really can't imagine it would be that hard to do these characters correctly. Really, all you have to do is just look at what Adam Sandler is doing with his current project, and then don't do that. Just do the exact opposite of that. It's all you gotta do. It's that simple. Overall, the natives are very strange in this movie, and not just because of their surprisingly diverse racial backgrounds. There is a lot of weirdness going on here. For one thing, they all appear to have the ability to defy gravity at least to some extent. There is a- they don't actually fly because Peter is the only one who can fly because chosen one, but they do kind of play loose with the rules of gravity. There's a lot of wire foo going on in any action scene that these people are involved in. It seems like gravity in Neverland is more of a polite suggestion than an actual law. Also, when they die, I'd love to know how they came up with this idea. When they die... Stay with me. They explode into a puff of pastel-colored dust. I'm gonna say that again. When the natives are killed in this movie... Poof! Pastels! I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. At first, when I saw this happening, when they had their first big fight with the pirates, I thought this was just some kind of creative use of smoke bombs, like they were trying to use this as a tactic during the fights, but eventually I realized, no, that's how they die. I, this movie is such a train wreck. It really is. However, I will give it this. It is a beautiful train wreck. I mean, the cinematography and the set design and the costume design and so much of this just looks so very, very good. And it's definitely helped by the 3D and much like The Martian, which I reviewed previously, this is also shot in native 3D and it looks fantastic. Some of the CGI is a bit hit and miss, especially when it comes to the Neverland wildlife, but overall it's pretty decent, and the action sequences are a lot of fun, despite the pastel explody weirdness, but beyond that, they are a lot of fun, especially towards the end when Peter Pan harnesses the power of the fairies and goes Super Saiyan or something. It's just, yeah, it's weird, but it is kind of fun to watch. And I mentioned Jupiter Ascending earlier. This reminds me of Jupiter Ascending in so many ways because much like Jupiter Ascending, it's a train wreck, but man, it looks so gorgeous. As far as the acting, there were some good and some bad. Uh, Garrett Hedlund, who plays Hook, I really did not like him and I'm having trouble figuring out exactly what it was. I don't know if it was just his delivery or the accent that he chose to use, or I don't know if he chose it or the director did, but, or maybe it was just the dialogue, but man, this guy was grating. I just, I could not stand the guy at all. Um, for the rest of the cast, Rooney Mara was okay. Uh, Levi Miller, who plays Peter, I actually thought he did a pretty good job. Adil Akhtar, I hope I'm saying his name right, who played Sam Smeagol, aka Smee, was also pretty good. He had a few funny comic relief bits here and there. I kind of liked him. But the man who steals the show is Hugh Jackman as Blackbeard. This guy. Oh, this guy. He is having entirely too much fun with this role, and he is a joy to watch anytime he is on camera. It doesn't matter how stupid the world is that he is in, it doesn't matter if he's singing Smells Like Teen Spirit, he is still fun to watch. So, how am I gonna call this one? Cuz... It's not a good movie. It's definitely not. It's... 
really weird and really stupid and just what the fuck were they even thinking? I don't know. But on the other hand, <laughs> you know, it almost has to be seen to be believed. It really does. And I think there are a lot of people out there who will get some enjoyment out of this, much in the same way as Jupiter Ascending. I keep coming back to that, although personally, I don't think I like this as much as I like Jupiter Ascending, but it is still kind of along the same line. So if you think that is the type of movie you can get some enjoyment out of, I wouldn't say pay full price, but I would recommend at least a matinee. I, I think it's worth that. And go ahead and spring for the 3D surcharge as well because the 3D looks pretty good. Now, if you are not the type that can enjoy that kind of movie, then just do not bother with this one at all. Don't see it in the theater. Don't see it on DVD. Don't see it on cable. Just, just don't. Because, my God. My God. I don't know how this happened. I really don't, well... You know, when you pair the director of Hannah with the writer of Ice Age Continental Drift, I guess weird things are going to happen. And that is all I have to say about Pan. So until next time, take care.